again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Strauss and Company. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, you today are going to be joined by our, our uh, Strauss and Company's uh, chairperson, um, Mr. Frank Kilborn, um, who's just arrived. Uh, so Frank, thanks very much for joining us this afternoon and taking um, a, a, some of your very busy time out to uh, to come and talk to us about art. Um, it's, uh, I suppose, really what the what the spirit of um, August uh, August Art Month uh, at Valkyrie is all about. And um, you know, in absence of the in absence of the of the real thing and us being able to be there, um, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to take stock and uh, to hear some of the highlights from you. So, Frank, uh, uh, I'm going to well, welcome you and thank you very much for joining us today. Okay, so we know where we are, so we can move immediately to the next uh, thing. I'm going to just make this thing a little bit smaller that I can see the whole screen. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, this is a beautiful homestead of Valkemiant, one of the oldest homesteads in South Africa, the second oldest, in fact. Uh, people first started habitating there in, uh, I think, 1697. Uh, it's on the grounds of high school Jan van Riebjerk. Our kids were at the primary school. As you know, we've been living in the city well for a long time. And we always uh, knew about this uh, beautiful building, but we were never really had the opportunity to, to go to it much because our kids were not in the high school yet. And yeah, it, everything starts uh, normally with a letter or invite. And this followed the same course. Yes, Amanda Boerta, as we know, she spoke two weeks ago about her strong relationship with Burniev and with Valkemiend over many decades, in fact. And um, here we see, uh, an email that Amanda sent to Lizelle and myself uh, with the full cooperation of Eliana LaRue, who's basically the CEO of Alchemyant, if you want to call it that, asking whether we wouldn't be willing to uh, work with uh, uh, Stefan Bells and Strauss and Company to organize a fundraising uh, for Alchemyant, at the same time to have a bit of uh, uh, art exhibition in order to, you know, to promote the venue and to promote also to promote the Burnia collection that was at the venue. So, uh, well, it started there. Uh, Lizelle and I thought about it and we decided to, to pursue this invitation or to take it up. Uh, it had nothing to do with Stefan's charm, of course, nor with Bina's or anyone else involved. But uh, yeah, we were then, have known them for quite a long time. We're quite excited about the potential and we really, after having visited uh, Belgium a few times and having observed the passion that Elena and Karen and a lot of the friends of Belgium have for this amazing building, we, we really thought it would be a good idea to enhance the profile of Belgium as a cultural historical treasure and also as a unique function in the exhibition venue. So clearly we wanted to raise funds for the restoration of the facility and to expand its operations, but also it was an opportunity for us to, to, to um, you know, expand our passion for sharing our art with people and our collection so and our education is close to our hearts so it was also an opportunity to generate more understanding of art that both for the junior high schools in the whole area we also thought it would be a good idea if we have a facility at our disposal to maybe highlight the works of some artists that have been forgotten a bit and you know the overall thing as jonathan block always said it's the most important thing is to have fun with friends and co-collectors and also our, our very great uh, joint venture partners with that state was Strauss and Company, Dalier Graf, the Friends of Alchemy, and Auntie Liana and Karen. So, the first show, um, Matthew, we were obviously a bit nervous, I guess, and we didn't have a lot of time. So, we call it uh, Is Collecting an Art or the Art of Collecting? That sounded a bit presumptuous. So, we turned it around and say, Is Collecting an Art? And we um, yeah, we, we highlighted some South African martyrs, both young and old, and hinted at some emerging talent. And it was simply a celebration of, of uh, 50 works from our, our own personal collection. And as you know, we collect art from basically the 1900s till tomorrow. And the program was very simple. There was a dinner, a few walkabouts, and a cocktail party. And um, yeah, so what did we show people? We started very conventionally. We showed them a nice period of the Bosfeld. And very early Maggie Loebscher, like Gardia, uh, then went on to Walter Batters, uh, Africans in the Autumn, a work that was presented at the Venice Biennale, beautiful work of Jean Bell's Cape Cod, uh, Alexis Price Christed, Mary De Caleri of Gerard Zucotto, 
And this is quite interesting, I think, we, we had the general from William Kentridge and at the same time had this amazing Conte drawing of um, Paul Emsley of Kentridge. And uh, it's quite, I find it quite fun to put them next to each other. I don't know what you think. Okay. Frank, that brings me to a point. Yeah, Sorry, everyone I wants to hear me. Sorry, I, I realized I was <laughs> muted, Frank. But I, I suppose just as we get onto this, there, there's always been, and I think it's necessary to explain quite a quite a curatorial, quite a curatorial eye. You've always lent, you've lent the home, well, you've lent the homestead to 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 uh, as a as an environment to hang your collection. Can you? And I, I think this first exhibition is is worth um, is worth noting because. It was re where you laid the ground base, the sort of curatorial ground base for the construction of the exhibitions that you that you've um, that you've brought afterwards. I mean, this really, I suppose, presents yeah. the, the 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 foundations for yeah. for South African art history and your collection. To be honest, Matt, I wouldn't call this show necessarily a curated one. It was more a sharing. Yeah. Uh, it was new to us, and we. Uh, often opened our home for people because I believe art needs to be shared. But clearly this was the first time uh, I had to sort of hang around the central theme. And it was quite a, it's quite a broad theme. So I just wanted to share uh, with people a variety of artworks, both old and new, sculpture and, and paintings, and to just sort of pique people's interest to see uh, what will come in the future. But it was very much I think in the latter shows, you will see that it's, uh, hopefully it's much more curated than, than the first one was. And um, yeah, so if we, I mean, I just want to try and get back into this thing. So there we go. Uh, there was some, and I played a little bit with modern and uh, sort of classical interior, you know, lock interior, in a uh, by Eric Loebscher. And then we went a little bit more modern. I played with some, some almost super realistic works. Gina Maya, uh, uh, Gina Haya, who was sort of very much influenced by Adrian von Sayl, who painted these incredible realistic paintings. And then something that's almost hyper realistic from James Mooney, the Rondo Bay 357. And that, uh, these three uh, paintings generated quite a lot of interest. In fact, I found it very difficult to explain to people that the first one was not a photograph. So we ended up with a, a that was also sort of the advert for the thing was uh, Brighton Breitenbach work about Herman Charles Bosman and I remember we did three or four walkabouts including a whole group from Paul that took the trouble to come through and from Franz Huck and we had quite an interesting discussion about the various personalities that Herman Charles Bosman had obviously having been in jail for manslaughter and having written some of the you know most iconic uh, sort of stories of our time and the way he captures this book with the the, the fingers that are sort of all wrapped up and yeah it, it led to a lot of interesting conversation which is exactly what we aim to do and that was to start a conversation around art let people feel free and comfortable to engage with art there's always i something i always said at every walk about and that is there are no stupid questions about art there are only stupid answers and if you you can engage with art at a variety of levels and still find an incredible amount of joy out of it. And, and that's really the type of spirit we wanted to engender. Yeah, so the next year, it was slightly uh, a little bit more challenging. So we looked at more of the formal aspects of art. As an art student, you'll know color, form, and structure is the foundation of painting, I think, in many ways. So we looked at just uh, at the way that uh, the different artists played with, with those three components. And it was an invitation to look a little bit closer at the technical aspects of, of art, not just uh, just look at how people apply art, uh, paint, how they structure their compositions, how they tell their story. And then also at the same time, we, we entered into some debates with uh, other collectors about the role of art collectors and investors in the art market. And we had a special dinner where Stefan talked uh, with uh, Peter uh, from the Shirane Foundation now and myself. And we talked about collecting and uh, whether one should look at the market from a aesthetic point of view or as an artwork or a collecting point of view and how important it was to look at it uh, with an investor's eye. And it was, it was quite an interesting thing. 
So in the first year we raised, and from the beginning I said we raised money, and the first year we raised approximately all in all 200,000 rand. The, the evening itself raised 80,000 rand, and that immediately went into uh, the renovation of, thing. and we started renovating the main dining room and a couple of other really urgent renovations. So at least we started, you know, achieving goal number one. So uh, there was new, the main dining room was painted. I, with a new color, I battled to hang it with the previous color and we hung some chandeliers there. And that immediately made the painting a lot easier, but there were no art lighting in sight yet. Um, yeah, so this was the invitation with the beautiful work, New Eden of Pella, of the, of the conversation that I just referred to between Armand Stein, uh, Stefan and myself about uh, collecting art and art investment and so forth. Uh, there was some, we got some press uh, around it. And what I wanted to show you or share is um, just the very extensive program that consisted of five items, which was walkabout, walkabout, and the thing. And that was what the art week was really about uh, one cocktail, one dinner, and three walkabouts. Um, yeah, but it was, it was fun, notwithstanding. We, every year, we highlighted a, a specific artist. This year, it was a case of, of the turn of Paul de Tue. Uh, was an artist. He was born in Hout Bay, grew up uh, in the Cape, studied under Jean Bells for a bit of time, went and way. And he went from creating very realistic pictures, which uh, to a certain extent, into really trying to interpret what is happening and capturing the movement in nature. And these are two of his earliest works uh, from 1946 and 1948, respectively, which is, I think, some of the earliest that you will find. And I find them quite amazing. Uh, the struggle that's so evident in, in the first one, almost like an artist battling to portray his, the story, to tell the, to tell the story that, he, that he's sensing and feeling and finding it very difficult to do so. So, and if you look at the left, that's sort of a much later work, you'd say, but almost more realistic. But if you look very carefully, you'll see that he abstracted all the, the leaves and turned a whole tree into just one leaf. Because in fact, all the leaves are just one composite leaf in the end, if you think about it. And then, you know, as we know, Paul Dwey then he ended up in the right, went and studied overseas, Paris, London, got involved with the hard edge movement, you know, cubism. And yes, look at this incredible interlinked uh, structure that he created, almost monumental in a small work. And um, it's called Continuous Movement. And it's this sort of juxtapositioning and this growth in an artist's life and his journey that we were very keen to share with other people. Frank, if I can yeah, just, uh, yeah, can sorry, I Matt. ask a question at this point. Also, it was also, was it at this point where you started, I suppose, developing, developing the, the idea of, uh, of, of, of trimming down the artists? Because I know then the following year, um, you included some more artists. So the numbers and the ratios of artists have, have, have varied as the themes have varied, have they not? Yes, indeed. In the first two years, we only showed really 50 artworks. And there were quite a number, uh, there were a number of the rooms that weren't quite ready for art. And in the, initially, the first year, we did it in conjunction with the Budniev collection. So the Budniev collection uh, was hanging and then we hung around it. But in the years to come, as we renovated more rooms and they installed art lighting, there were obviously more rooms to hang. And as you will well know from being on a ladder with me for what time in the morning, we ended up hanging roughly around 90 works uh, in the latter shows. Okay, but here, just again, two old stores, Burnside, uh, typical Cape scene, as well as Guela Goodman, Dawn on Table Mountain, uh, still one of my favorite paintings. Uh, and then we went to show a little bit when people work a little more clearly with, with form and structure, and it was the form of, you know, and link that with a more realistic approach, which Alex does and Jimmy Eve. Uh, uh, we looked at uh, Claude Boucherain, which sort of at the end of art extraction, and a very interesting work, I think, from Sokoto, where a very sort of uh, geometric, almost post-cubist work, uh, which is not something he did that often. And I called a jazz band, he played jazz, and I love the way that the reds overlap as you, a jazz composition really is made up, you know, of overlaying tunes and things. So it was, uh, I quite liked that work, and it was, I think it was an interesting addition to most people's perception of Sokoto's work. And many people did not uh, really know Claude Bircherain the wife of uh, Eric Lopes. We, there's some new work from Peter Eastman, beautifully executed, very different way of painting. And then if you juxtapose it with Johannes Mankins and Francois Krieger, much more traditional. I still think that's the best looking Roy cut uh, in town. 
on the left, but um, yes, it was uh, two lovely pictures, I think. And then, of course, an artist that you know something about, Georgina. And I put the Georgina next to the Chris who could see her because both seemed to me to have an incredible confidence in handling color and, and texture. And I think Chris, who, you know, on the pa little painting on the right, if you think that everything that's in there, without even a, a reinterpretation of the theme like Georgina is doing there, you know, it, both of them incredibly brave, uh, exuberant paintings that, that really delight the eye and also at the same time challenge the, the conventions that people have about how something should look or how paint should be applied or how formal structures you utilize. So I love the two paintings together. Uh, as you know, I'm a big fan of Fred Page, so I hung at four of them, but I just put three in here. And that's, there's always a scent of the macabre there, and you have to just start laughing. Uh, I think the names are particularly funny. And yeah, they were introduced to show how people can work just in black and white with a hint of color, and at the same time tell this story extremely effectively. And obviously in his case, with a combination of satire and a bit of surrealism. Yeah, nice pink fruit will Dali would have been happy with that. And then we, on a satirical note, we ended up with all Wari Kemp's little piglets. There were 11 of them. They all tell the story of capitalism and the abuse of power. And I thought um, it's uh, very apt for the current times, especially the one called Cooking the News in the middle. Um, yeah, so the next year, year three, we, it was uh, just after the, Stefan Wells passed away unexpectedly in December the previous year. And, um, we, it was very much a, something that we did together with Stefan and Lina, especially from Strauss. And yeah, it was a big loss. And we decided the next year to, to honor his legacy and his involvement with Belkamian, because he was involved here even before Lazelle and I got involved. And we did so by dedicating part of the exhibition to the works of, of Jean Bells, his father, and also by the theme that we picked, which was really conversations, because uh, Stefan had an amazing ability to bring art to life by telling stories about all aspects of the art world, including artworks, dealers, galleries, and collectors. And I was always haranguing him to, to pin these, these stories down, and he always tell me he would do it one day when he's not so busy. So we thought, let the works tell a story by themselves. And something which I always say is that um, every artwork, in essence, is an exchange of information between the artist, the work, and the viewer. In many ways, uh, you know, on, on the ex many ways that what you see and how you react to the works on the, on an exhibition and also what you collect that's also the story of your life and it's um you know it, it was interesting for me to to select paintings uh, reflecting people in conversational settings either talking playing arguing all in all just living the story of their lives so uh, we had 45 51 works with 45 artists uh, artists and that's the first year that we actually introduced the formal lecture program we printed, um, the first two years, we just printed a little booklet out, which helped me to remember all the artworks I had to do the walkabouts. But at least now we have a, I t you know, a list, the index, which tells us which artists featured uh, on painting, and it's quite a uh, wide variety of people. Um, we started off with Jean Wells, as I said, I think two beautiful works, the Three Graces and Seated Nude. Uh, I think two lovely examples of his work at, at his best. And, you know, I was, I have to say up front, um, even though in the initial years we worked very much with our own collection, there were always works that, um, that we didn't have in our collection, which I thought needed to be featured. And I was always amazed by the generosity of other collectors in lending the works for us for exhibition. And the one on the right was such a work, which is an absolute little beauty. The interesting thing about the two works on the, on the next side, the one on the right hand side is conversation. So that's not going to have to be a genius to figure out why we put it on the show. But, but the one on the left, uh, you know, was one of um, uh, Stefan's uh, most tr treasured uh, belongings. And he, he always said he will never sell it. It's a really beautiful work. And we always speculated it might have been a picture of his mother and him. But uh, it's a little bit too small to tell. But I know he, he was really very fond of that work. And another work that he was very keen on is the, one, the next one on the Breda River. And I quote uh, something that he said on YouTube. I said, um, I trust you will appreciate my wanting to include this la landscape. It, it captures memories of my youth. It's a landscape of the Breda River, my father in 1947, at the height of his career in many ways. There's a lovely spontaneity. It is winter, the mountains are bluer after the rain, 
vegetation, the green and the flow of water is there and a wonderful area of water coming across. And then the vegetation and then the distance, the clouds and the blue mountains. That is exactly what it looks like. Be assured, I can tell you. And uh, isn't it special to, to hear Stefan about this, this very vibrant painting and on the right, uh, the Silai, uh, which is a very well-known painting, much more structured and very nuanced. And I think that was sort of for me a conversation in contemplation. Obviously, maybe you know, it's, it's always a good idea to start a, a, a show about conversation with the conversation between the two Arabs. I haven't yet quite figured out what the one is saying to the other, but as I always said, I think who got, I know who got the better end of the bargain. Um, and Walter Batis's works is always a very significant degree of conversation or very often paints people in dialogue or in a setting where a market on the right, African market, like Limpopo people on the market, on the left they're doing the shaman, the trance dancing. Uh, you know, so people are always in, in relating to each other in a particular way. And in many of his works, he captures that moment uh, uh, as well. Uh, the same sort of in a very different way, Cecil Scottness and Lucky Sabia, uh, mystical figures, as Lucky explained to me, that work is all about communication as well. Then going back a little bit, uh, a lovely work by William Timlin, The Fairy Jewels, as the princess is sort of conversing with all the little, what shall we call them? uh fairies i guess uh floating through the air and then the little conversation on the right which is sort of typical of court gossiping i think uh lovely little work and on the right of course a very important work i think of dorothy k capturing the old men reading the lists of the casualties of war uh to see that it used to publish these lists and uh, she captured that as you know she was an official wolf uh artist in the Second World War. So the two subject matters are quite different, but I think they both capture a particular moment beautifully. So then just to turn around a little, two figures in the street that walking down, from uh, down sort of memory lane, all dressed up from Cecil Hicks. Uh, you know, a number of people conversing and talking, capturing a moment in, in uh, uh, by uh, Gregor Burnside, District 6. And then uh, Ermiston just calling it dockside conversation. And we can see there's a nice bit of gossiping going there. Um, these two works are slightly different way of communication. And I, I found them both quite powerful by Maurice van Esch. The left hand side sort of typically uh, in demonstrating the, the very tough environment in which fishermen, artisanal fishermen li lives. And you can see that sort of daily grind wearing people down, you know, but at least they've got something uh, to eat. And on the right hand side, I find that also the lack of communication between the, the man and the wife with going in opposite di directions, looking in opposite ways, yeah, sort of a stultified moment. These are also depicting very different sentiments on the left hand side, Pemba with a uh, called track, but it's really a force removal scene. I think a very poignant picture, beautifully executed, a little Billy Bester of children with a go-kart and then Women in the Country Chatting Away by Gerard Sukato. Three different sentiments at play, but still conversing. Uh, I think a beautiful ma uh, Marty Wallace for me, a spring toe, the kids playing, lovely shadows uh, on the ground. Very structural for Marty, uh, I think, uh, Matt. Uh, not as sort of, um, she's more very, the narrative is normally more important to her, it was almost the structure, but yeah, I thought she included a lot of structural components in the work, shadows. And uh, the composition was obviously very critical for uh, yeah. And then um, a lovely work by Nkatani of the snow that fell in Soweto in 1966 and the kids playing in the snow. Some more uh, chance of chat by Sam, an Egyptian artist just catching these people going about their daily lives. And I believe made the double show. He must be very happy. He got into the show twice. So let's skip that. And then you yeah, two. Uh, large-scale paintings by B.Z. Bailey. The one was called Witches of, on Wall Street. And it was typical just before we got another crash of all the bad news flying around in air and sort of trouble a, a brewing and uh, people not looking up to see it, except the one lady looking up in quite a bit of amazement to see all the witches flying so brazenly during the day. On the right, I think a, a really amazing work uh, called Stormy Weather and sort of uh, 
hinting at the times post Mandela, where we all went from the rainbow nation to the real challenges that we face today. This work is, um, is for me, is a very special tool as Alan myself. It's a work by William Kentris called Seated Man, served by Standing Companion. And it's, it's quite large. It's almost 1.4 meters, I'd say, or more by meter. And it's done very interesting with um, shoe polish and wax. And he did this in 1991 as part of that domestic scenes uh, thing that he did. And yeah, there are only six of them as far as I know. And um, yeah, quite a special work that's been in our collection for a long time. I really like that satirical elegance of the man just not even caring that a naked woman is serving him tea, which was so opposite the reality of, of 1991. Yeah, some more conversations. Matthew Hindley, sort of very apocalyptic view of city. And then, uh, you know, that sort of thing with Mr. Second, uh, there's some the runner up. I thought it was the second runner up by Michael Sabosky of the Beaufort West teen show competition. And that sort of, you know, process whereby you, you're trying to portray a particular image of yourself or find endorsement in a particular way. And then some interesting works, just some, some uh, photography. Jürgen Schadenberg of Trevor Huddleston. I think that's a lovely um, picture and even more so because of the very interesting frock he's wearing. Uh, then, <laughs> you know, George Hallett capturing two sort of gossiping scenes and people talking outside in District 6 and one on Simonstown. And then the conversation. That was very easy to include that work by, by Villa. So that was to the point. And then, obviously, I think... Uh, uh, May Williamson's work that's very, uh, Sue Williamson's work about the tale of the two Craddocks, which in one work tell the story of two societies living next to each other, but having very, very different lives. Yeah, and then George Ramachaka, Mother and Child, uh, I thought they, they all served to tell the story that we wanted to tell. Okay, okay then Eliana started making some reports, and I'm just highlighting it that we, in these sort of years, between these two years we raised, uh, I think in the first year, uh, 200 rand and uh, 200,000, the second year 300,000 between ourselves and the exhibition and Strauss. And by directly, the funds generated by the exhibition on those two years was about 200,000 rand. And that enabled them to start, make a serious start to the renovation work at, at Valkyrie. Okay, so come year four, the exhibition. I was worried I'm not going to get through all the slides, but as Caro always said, at the speed I'm talking, uh, I'll have to make another 100 slides. But um, yeah, so this was year four, and I think this is the first we, we printed an official booklet. So we were growing up with the exhibition, and uh, you know, I also didn't start hanging the night before. We started hanging three nights before, as you will remember, and uh, laid out the exhibition beforehand, and really started to take the whole thing a slight bit more seriously. Frank, um, interestingly enough, this was, um I suppose working working off the conversations of the conversations theme from the previous year in memory of Stefan, this was one of the first times that saw you teaming up with a collector and um, starting to invite. And uh, as you said earlier, you know sometimes um, works aren't in your collection, but you feel the necessity for them to be included. This was um, one of the first years that you started inviting other collectors and 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 teaming up your various collections, isn't it? No, absolutely, Matt. I mean, um, I think in the, initially it was almost just a matter of convenience. It was, uh, it's always a busy month and it was almost just easier if we could do it ourselves. But over time, I, I felt the need to share this whole experience of putting it together. Uh, I wanted to share it with fellow collectors. And secondly, it was also more important for Valchemy and to bring a broader range of work than was just in our collection for it as a destination and for people to get to attract a different audience. And I also realized um, in particular when I wanted a certain focus areas that there were people who had much better collections than me that focus, that focus specifically on that periods of time. So I was very happy to team up, Lizal, I to team up with Peter Kulain. He's, he's, um, he's got an extensive collection also of contemporary work, but it, his collection was really founded on the works of the period of the 50s to the 70s, and specifically non-figurative abstract art. Now, you would know that abstract art as a whole is, hasn't got the, the biggest following in South Africa, and I can tell you non-figurative abstract art is certainly a sub-genre that has not enjoyed a lot of publicity up to that period in time. 
Uh, I know uh, Bailon has had a few good shows of individual artists, but I think it's the first time that someone tried to put together a range of artists and artworks uh, from that period. And yeah, we, uh, the highlighted artist was Kenneth Bucker, continuing our theme of, of artists that have been sort of slightly mislooked, or, uh, overlooked over time. And then the prominent artists included Eric Laucher, Paul de Tue, Georgina Ormiston, Haniki van der Bad, Kevin Anderson, Sisley Sash, Jean Lambeshan, and Preller and Batches. So let me see if I, yep, sorry. Frank, just, a, just a sort of a, a, a leading in question. Um, one of those, many of those names are recognized, but some of them, as you were talking about with um, Kenneth Bucker, aren't necessarily um, kind of, you know, famous in the, in, the, in the South African art historical canon. How do you feel that, as you said, the, you know, being driven, driving, being driven from a private initiative, how do you feel that um, you participated in, I suppose, redressing some of these kinds of perceptions or, 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 re, or shedding new lights on, on artists that haven't necessarily been considered in, the, in, in these kinds of leagues? So G Georgina Ormiston probably very rarely has hung with the likes of uh, Walter Battis and Alexis Preller. How do you find that um, these uh, kind of conversations have been stimulated by this kind of initiative? Yeah, I think it's absolutely critical, Matt. And, and this is, I mean, it's obviously important, um, say from art, the historical point of view, and from a purely intellectual approach, it's important to see how different people tackle this period and from what point of view they did. But for me, there's also something of the treasure hunt in it because it's, it's incredibly uh, rewarding to stumble almost upon an artist whose work you haven't seen before and then really just sort of engage with it and fall in love with it. And I thought it was, um, it was something that we could add and that we could present because we had no commercial motive other than to raise funds for the Alchemy and with these shows that we were at liberty to introduce works that people might not normally have included in a show like this because people would not necessarily have paid money to see these works. And we could, we could put them into the mix, play a little bit with people's perceptions or expectations in many instances. And um, this, was, this was such a show. Um, I think some of the works that, that drew the most conversation on this thing, other than people were amazed at what Kenneth Bucker was going about, you know, were exactly these sort of people. I'm trying to look down the list here. Um, I even included the Tretchikov and the abstract thing, which was quite interesting. But um, um, Gassner, Jack Heath, we will go through some of these, these names, were really unknown artists to a lot of people. And, uh, yeah, it, it, in the end, it was, I think it was a lot of fun and it worked out, I think, quite well. So this is just telling the story a little bit of us uh, with, with Peter and we took some pictures, beautiful Prella there. And I started, we started really upping our marketing. This is, there's now a real series of lectures. They are master classes. They are walkabouts. They're, they're, they're still the, the fundraising dinner and then the cocktail party, the cocktail party being... Uh, a event that we started from the beginning where we invite all the players in the art market. Any of our competition at Strauss, those days they weren't my competition, but now, but we invited the, you know, artists, collectors, lecturers, you know, it's just a celebration of, and, and a get together of everyone involved in the art thing. And it's become, I think, a nice, a permanent feature on the, on the art calendar. But this is just to show some of the events that were, and I think these works photographed very, really beautifully and I think they brought a lot of uh, interest to the shows. So here's Kenneth Bucker, you know, a really interesting uh, dude I'd say and I think the works you know containing uh, perspex and all sort of things were I think they they mesmerized and confused and uh, a lot of people at the show but in the end I think there was a general recognition that he was very imaginative. I personally love these works and I think they're uh, very carefully constructed and there's a real dignity and, and a solid, solid sense of, of uh, balance in them. On that note, we hung these two beautiful constructions of old Tue at the back wall. And remember where we were with the aloes? Now we're into this almost deconstructed planes and he's still busy with the same thing. And you can almost see it in the right because there's, I would call typical Paul de Tue colors, but definitely not the red and black, which is an incredibly... Uh, dramatic work. And then Charles Gassner and Jack Heath. Um, but I think people might were even more surprised to see that someone like Gregor Bunsai did sort of quite abstracted 
almost cubist driven works early in his life. And I think both of them are beautiful examples. Um, right. The one on the right, quite lyrical, I think. At the That's time, I made the observation about these two works, and um, and I, I still remember actually giving one of those Sunday walkabouts, Saturday morning walkabouts, and I stood in front of these two paintings because you had them next to each other, and I said that for me, this um, bringing because I suppose we we are used to many of the many of the um, sort of uh, Bunzai was very prolific, and we're used to the the work of uh, that that was executed later on in his life. Um, but I remember the observation, making the observation that these are such solid works that I would feel that you could hang them in any of, in any museum in the world with uh, with their um, impressionist and modernist works, and they would and they would um, rival and fit into this kind of trajectory of art history. Um, I, I think it was a, it was really insightful. How have you how have you find how have you found um, the opportunity to bring these kinds of works out? I mean, it's a uh, it, you know, it, on the one hand, I remember looking at some of the abstract works and thinking, well, they are so fresh that they could have been painted yesterday, but they were from yeah. you know, now in the in, now in 2020, looking back, they're 50 years old, but, you know, they've got a sort of an utter contemporaneity. And then, you know, these modern works uh, are of such a such an international standard. Um, and, and I suppose there was this real dialogue for me of what abstraction had allowed South African artists to do at the time. Yeah, I think that what was interesting about that time, remember we, South Africa moved into isolation at, at the, at the, in the seventies, at the end of the sixties. But until then, these artists all lived abroad. They converse with artists uh, internationally. They, they, they participated in shows. They went to the Venice Biennale. They went to the Sao Paulo Biennale. They, they were very much in tune with what was happening in the world. Um, and we we forget that I mean they they sort of compared themselves to the masters to the best of the best and I agree with you I think these two particular works can hang at any exhibition of its kind in the world and yeah it was a pity that that after the lockdown South Africa went we got excluded from the international art scene and these artists almost got became forgotten and many of them reverted back to making much more realistic works and much more of the sort of similar formula they had before. Because that's where the market was. It was a very little market for abstracted works of these kinds. Um, and it was a pleasure to show. And you're right. Once we hung them together, I think if you remember, they started almost singing to each other. It was an incredible um, sense of energy. And I, think, and I remember those Nils Burbages hanging, two of them hanging above the piano in, uh, you know, in, in the sort of main salon. And... How, how incredible those works looked at and that destination. I hope I have a picture. And they were hanging at the same room as these. So it was, I think that the conversation, the dialogue, the, the empathy between these works were amazing on this show. I just made a little collage of the Eugene Labachance that we had together. They were hanging at different sort of places. You can see the strong structural component, use of color of these works. Very immersive, isn't it? Can dive into it. Um, yeah, these were slightly more hard-edged, abstracted. Haneke, Eric Loebscher, all, all these works, I think, uh, yeah, really, for me, absolutely beautiful and very, very exciting in very different ways. So, uh, Kevin Atkinson's Plato's Cage re-emerge. Cave re-emerges. Um, yeah, a lot of attention. The big red one at the back wall. I think Jack Heath was one of the biggest surprise packages uh, at the show, the work on the left, Thornfeld, you know, both of them were about the bushveld, you know, about thorn trees. And if you, if you see, see the title, you can see the sort of thorny aspect of it, but it would have been hell of a tough to guess uh, up front. But it's, I, li I enjoyed the vibrancy and it's lovely to see Jack's works on auction now becoming very, very collectible. And I hope the show had something to do with it. As always, uh, we expected Portway to be there, but not a lot of people would have expected Peter Clark to be there with an abstract landscape. Uh, and uh, I remember one or two art fundi uh, experts coming to me, turning it upside down four times because they had some difficulty believing. And it's a lovely story is when he went overseas for the first time and he flew an airplane for the first time and it was full moon and they, I think he was flying to America and he saw, you know, flying over the landscape, he saw the moon coming up and he, it was just an incredible setting for him. And he painted it. And if you look at it, 
Uh, I think Larry Scully, uh, there were all the beautiful works of Larry Scully on the show, obviously, but I think he would have been extremely happy to have painted this. Okay, so on to the next year. Um, by this stage, we, we thought, uh, you know, this. if you look at the Valchemian uh, art month, it really starts with um, Lizelle and Hanley and Elena and Karen and Tanya and Bina uh, and Margaret uh, meeting on the second week of January and they start planning this thing in incredible detail. And I sort of looked at the thing and I realized that it was very much a women-driven endeavor, the Belgium Art Month, I just got the opportunity in the end to hang some pictures and amuse people, but all the artwork were really done by them. So in part to honor them, but also when I thought about it and the, it was a bit before the, the Me Too movement uh, got so much momentum and I just kind of reflected on it, I, I realized that uh, the South African art scene has always been driven by women and by women artists. And if you look at the past, you know, all our stats at Strauss proves that, I mean, Stern still outsells the second artist being PNF by two to one. And I thought it would be a good idea to celebrate uh, the creativity and the incredible contribution they've made. Also partly in recognition in respect to, as I said, to the team uh, at Valchemy and for all the work that they are doing behind the scenes. So yeah, there we had 91 works by 67 women artists. And I think uh, you may correct me, but I think that was the first exhibition of its kind in South Africa, as I think was the previous one. So I think we were getting a little bit more ambitious and hopefully a little bit more professional in, in what we're doing. It is always nice to have this picture of Mary Sabandia on an advert. Uh, you know, it's, it's so striking. You can see the price of the dinner went up to a thousand rand a person. And we're happy to say every time we're full, and we raised uh, decent money for Valchemian. And I just sort of thought it'd be a good idea to, to show some of the, the adverts that went out for the various functions and events uh, uh, that was sitting. And it was an incredibly busy program. I mean, there were classical music concerts. There were, as Maud Sumner was promoting there, then Valhallen von Rensburg were talking about still lives. Uh, we had a, another musical performance and a conversation between Amanda Buerta and Dr. Susan Fosluer. Uh, on the left, we had a whole art evaluation course that Lizelle and Amanda uh, presented. And the whole concept of master classes uh, really got gained momentum that year. We had uh, uh, talks about abstract art. And then, of course, on the left hand side, uh, the two works by Nelly Rasmus, you would know that immediately after this, we followed it up with another month in which we had a sort of celebratory exhibition of Nelly Rasmus's works, uh, celebrating a 90th birthday, 50 years, uh, so 60, I guess, 60 years of involvement in South African art scene, always staying on, in abstract art movement. Very, very amazing experience, very uh, enriching in every possible way. Yeah, the, there's... Uh, a nice invitation from Georgina to attend a auction mechanics workshop by Bina. Uh, they were, uh, yeah, and talks about materiality, a beautiful masterclass, extremely well attended by, uh, which was presented by Penny Siopus. We were very blessed by the amazing contribution and support we've had over the years. So you can't talk about female or women artists without talking about the three market leaders, but Slightly different pictures. The one from Maggie, uh, to be expected, I guess. The one from 1922 of Irma Stern, Women of Clenched Fist, is one of the sort of earliest works that we know in South Africa. It's still done when she was in Germany. And then the right hand side, 1952, sort of a smirk of disapproval. And I, find, I quite enjoy these works. They're, they're quite atypical. And I also think what they do is they, they help busting the myth that Irma just exotified people and made them beautiful. If she wanted to paint you like she thought you were really, she painted you like that. Uh, you can't have an exhibition of this kind without the Everard family, ELM King, Bertha, Mary, you know, Ruth Hayden, Everard Hayden, incredible artist, made the immense contribution. Again, I think she's got back, Marjorie and then Esmond White, uh, locked them together. These works also look, they were all in the sort of the last room, which were now beautiful. We've done the floors, uh, it, they put art lighting in it, and it used to be almost the worst room at Belkham, and it became their best place, as you know, 
to exhibit the conference room. It was beautifully redone. Uh, they've just actually also this year fixed the entire roof, which I'm very grateful of because we had one or two thunderstorms, which made us, our lives a bit interesting with rain coming in at places it shouldn't. But these large scale works uh, look unbelievable in that, in that venue, all three of them. And I, I was very really happy to see uh, both of them getting a lot of recognition now, and especially also the wonderful exhibition of Machavitz Bidi that was held at the Norwell Foundation last year. Uh, yeah, as I said, Penny Siopas featured prominently, did an awesome lecture, a masterclass for us, a uh, very powerful work of hers. Uh, uh, I played around a little bit with photography and more modern forms of expression. It's Maholi. Tanya Peterson, it's up in the back wall. I think the very striking conversation pieces. Uh, this was also quite interesting, adding Judith Mason uh, together with uh, Lisa Grobler uh, in the back room as well on the wall. I love that work in the middle called My Scullery. The first work is a lot more sober and, and, and very serious about child abuse and so forth. But uh, you can see Judith's light-hearted side and uh, sense of humor and fun in the middle work. And Lisa's work on the right is just simply extremely clever and very, very well done. It's also a beat work, which was, I think, the only one we had in the show to sort of, we started to demonstrate a little bit of what the modern forms of expression are. Yeah, and I just sort of end up with uh, a lovely, very peaceful work of more some that had hung in the salon, and I kept on looking at that as we attended all these classic music concerts on Sunday afternoons at one o'clock, which was not good for staying away. So <laughs> let's go on to exhibition six. That was last year. Uh, in a sense, I guess, uh, Matt, uh, the tightest collection that we, of theme that we've had up to now, only three artists with three guest artists. Again, a collaborative, um, event i mean i we teamed up with jonathan and marion bloch and then with carl visa and then we're fortunate enough to meet leo and erin potlasuk and um i had this idea even the previous year when we did that show in fact i got onto this idea when um when we did the show about the abstract expressionists and you know we engaged and i had a long chat with jonathan about things and went to their home and i look at the beautiful collection of uh, Hodgins that they've got and through him some mutual friends of ours got also got beautiful pinkers and I thought it would be interesting to I would first wanted to do a Hodgins and Pinker show and I thought you know they they're both so well established and so well known that would be a bit boring we need a wild card and for me the wild card was Alexander Potlasuk and um, Potlasuk uh, as I said uh, ironically enough uh, Lizelle and I collected his work before we collected um, the other two <laughs> mostly because his work has always been extremely undervalued and a lot easier, uh, simpler to afford. But I thought it would make for an interesting dialogue to hang these three together. And I don't think that has happened before either. So some of the adverts uh, is very quirky sense of humor of, <laughs> uh, of Robert Hodgins. I don't think it put too many people off that we had a thing about Hell Rage or Shell Garage. And the repairs done, but you know, as always, uh, you can just sense Robert laughing at you, the beautiful Pinker and Potlasuk. And um, yeah, some amazing works. And I, I, I just love hanging them together because the works of Danny Pinkers, they're so nuanced. They tell so many stories in one picture. They're incredibly finely executed. Um, and it's a deep academic philosophical approach to every single work. There is not a mark out of sight. And Hodgins works much more almost spontaneously uh you know and yeah it was it was interesting thing. and then potter soup was sort of the joker in the pack and he fell somewhere in between the two and because potter soup i think at um yeah he, he really brought his message across you know there's nothing subtle even though there's a slight sense of humor in all of them and they're actually very funny but if he wanted to portray something he did it very boldly and it's maybe three different approaches but all grounded I think in a sense of humor, irony, satire. Some pictures of the evening. Uh, it was really a lot of fun. That amazing work of, of Pinkers in the background. Bina raising some money for us there. Jonathan and I doing some singing. Supper. So it's Christopher Peter. Yeah, some of the, of the works on display. The room looked fantastic. Remember, Matt? I mean, the colors just were just 
unbelievable. I mean, one almost didn't want to walk out of it. It felt so amazing. I took these pictures before the show started and um, it was all set with that sense of anticipation before the evening started. But the room was already humming as be, to me as these paintings were conversing with each other and they all, they looked incredibly at home. I don't know if, if you would agree. I mean, Frank, you know, what was, what was quite interesting for me about this exhibition was the opportunity, because whilst, whilst Balcony and Art Month had presented, had presented these, I suppose, survey exhibitions up till this point, this, this um, exhibition, I suppose, represented a bit of a, not quite a U-turn, but a, 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 change, a change in direction where I suppose giving, giving such a space now, and also I suppose just for the audience's sake, you must remember that this was the this was the sixth exhibition um, and so the Valkyrian had been each year with the with the charitable contributions generated from these exhibitions um, the, the each year the exhibition space i suppose had got bigger and more accommodating so now yeah. i remember this being one of the first opportunities for with new lighting in the venue to really i suppose take over the entire venue and with this concentrated pared down view, the exhibition mm. was able to do something very different. Apart from those sort of more historical survey shows, here there was different kinds of conversations coming and a different kinds of understandings of how we could read an artist, a fuller, fuller production of, um, of, those, of those individual artists chosen. What, what, did you, mm. what did you start to notice between between somebody like as you said you know on the one hand you saw pinker as a as not a mark out of place with with uh, you know when there was the intuition of uh, of robert hodgins and then with the work of the pondershooks we start to see uh, almost a wedge in between those kinds of polarized positions what what was it like for you frank yeah i think he uh, uh, definitely energized the the exhibition because it, it was the wild card it, nobody not a lot of people know about his work it was brash it was and it was amazingly accomplished i think that's what people find amazing and i'll show some pictures now where we hung him right next to pinker pinker who i would regard as one of the most refined artists in south africa you know and, but you're right that as every year um i mean obviously elian and them had a lot of work to do to 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 protect the structural integrity of the building just fixing walls uh, fixing windows you know, doing these things. But every year we allocated a significant amount of money towards making it a better exhibition space. Whether it, I mean, this year, we, we, the second time we upgraded the lighting. A year or two before that, you know, we upgraded the hanging system. Um, I don't think I could have hung this exhibition there three years before that. It just wouldn't have been able to carry the colors and there's almost a sophistication of this type of show. I would say to people, they must remember that we hang Belgemeent like we would hang it as though it's our own home. It's a salon. It is a intimate viewing space. It's not a white cube. And I think this, that makes it incredibly challenging, of course, to make the pictures look at their best. But I think it's a much more welcoming, more softer uh, venue. You can really, you don't have to pretend that you know anything like you sometimes try and do when you walk into an all white cube and there's only one blob of yellow on the wall and people are going crazy about it. And you just wonder whether they haven't finished the painting. You know, in this space, you can really engage, relax, and, and still look at the work. But in order to hang these large-scale works, you need good lighting. You need a lot of things to be in place. So it was lovely to be able to fully capitalize now on the work that's been done in the previous years and put up what I thought, you know, and I shouldn't say it because we're involved, but I loved the show. I think it was, for me, museum quality. And I didn't paint any of these works. It was just so nice to put them all together and to observe the conversation that was going on and the way people engage with this. I mean, every single lecture, every single event was completely sold out. And, and there were like three a week. I think we presented 12 things. They were, you know, movie nights. And every single event was completely sold out. Um, it was, and we had an amazing amount of fun. So I see time is running on. So I will move on, um, Matt, if you don't mind. Let me just find the button. Okay, so this is the Marinetti, absolute sort of the highlight of the pinkers, maybe, and some to some extent, just from a technical virtuosity point of view, uh, his interpretation of the, the futurist 
and the impact of that movement on where we are in South Africa. Then this incredible war we had at the back with uh, Hodgins, oops, sorry, uh, on point on this thing with Hodgins. Uh, then we are uh, next to it, we had Potlasuka, next to it we had Pinker. And I would dare anyone to tell me that there's a huge difference in quality between these three works at anything, but albeit that we're talking about 3 million playing, you know, 1 million playing 200,000 or maybe 100,000. Um, incredible work. It's the middle one in the middle I love. The Pope is dead, long live the Pope. You know, the rise and fall, his and hers, the man in his office with a Van Gogh chair and the thing, ah, all in all, it was so much fun, wasn't it? I, I um, remember for one of the highlights for me through each of the, each of the artists, what you, you would find, each of the artists had a representation of a priest or a, or a vicar. Um, I remember yeah. a Hodgins, you just saw the Podler shook, and then Pinker, there was a, the, the big Pope hat. Um, and it was, it was funny because these kinds of things, um, I suppose you don't go looking for them. They, they only present, uh, present themselves to you. And it was very interesting. I suppose that it also spoke to the theme of the exhibition um, in, in terms of satire and irony and these, uh, these artists each individually um, sort of taking, taking, a, taking a shot at these established power systems um, and, and you know, conventions in society. I thought it was... Uh, yeah, was I think that... Yeah, they share a very common trait there. They both were deeply mistrustful of any form of authority, whether it be religious or political, and they kept on mocking them. Uh, in every work, you will find a sort of thing. But um, yeah, it was um, it was interesting the way that they did it uh, in certain things. And this is also part of the main dining room. I mean, these works, I all love them together. Uh, you know, a cozy coven in the suburbs is the Hodgins is called. And these two were at the back wall, the museum, the wax museum, and, and you know, uh, the beautiful pinker there next to it, end of time. And you, and you look at this, uh, the sort of, uh, you know, the parody of the knight attending a, you know, wax museum with sort of people walking upside down, almost Escher-like on top of his head, without a clue. I mean, the subtlety, even though his, his paint technique was often quite vibrant, there was always an incredible subtlety in their messaging. That uh, that is it in multiple layers. Yeah, absolutely, a lot of fun. And yeah, we have them together uh, in the sort of in the music room. These also incredible. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Very uh, ama uh, amazing pinker. I mean, uh, the nightingales. And I mean, I read up about it. Incredible too. And we had then also we had two paintings from the same series, and the uh, the Brett Murray that. Uh, that really intrigued all the kids that came to the show. And the one thing that, um, that I haven't said before, but uh, on some of the shows that we did, was incredible, the stories that the children wrote. And Elena has got a whole book and she gave me a copy of some of the most art rendering poems and stories that, that children wrote after having visited the exhibition. And we, remember we encouraged them to go and we asked them to look for certain things and there's a whole program but kids would just sit there and they would instinctively sense the underlying uh, mood of the painting, whether it was uh, sad or, or angry or whatever. And, and they responded to it very strong. And that alone, that book alone, made all of this worthwhile, uh, I think, for Lizelle and myself. Yeah, but some, much more, some more amazing um, uh, works of Hodgins. Lovely to be able to hang a work that consists of five individual pieces or three individual pieces in one thing. Neil Dundas gave us a lovely talk about these. And then there's Pot right at the end. I love these pictures of him and his wife and the dark handlers, the dogs clearly seriously in control. It feels a little bit like living in South Africa. There are always a lot of dogs running around with us trying to have some semblance of control over things. Um, I think the back room was looked fantastic with, with these three sculptures of... So what we decided when we had the three main satirists of Aronis, and I included Marianne and, uh, and uh, Pod as sort of one, one artist for purposes of this thing, I really wanted to, to introduce two artists which currently work with the same themes. And that was then Richard Mudariki and Brett Murray. And I think Brett Murray most probably misses satire uh, with his vulture there. Corner. We'll look at the three of them together. Uh, Marianne also got a great sense of humor, uh, sort of, the lady there looking for a job at the burlesque show. Uh, these 
very, very strong works of Richard Mederiki's uh, Letters from Home, Cape Town, and, uh, very, and uh, A Cry for the Rhino, obviously the interpretation of Munch. Uh, I think they, they worked incredibly well in that space, I think, Matt. And yeah, they were anchored with these three sculptures in the middle. Uh, the hear no evil, see no evil, and the gorilla, and then the vulture uh, waiting for and sort of poised. Uh, the combination of the three was just absolutely awesome. And I gave a lot of weight in a way and dignity uh, to the whole exhibition. I unfortunately, all the pictures I have, and I took quite a few of videos. And as I've now learned from Zoom, that it's not exactly always so video friendly, especially not here uh, where I am in the Classeria at the moment. Yeah, so these works had a lot of fun, incredible wall of Robert Hodgins, every individual work, a little masterpiece. Yeah, and then we ended the show with a, as a forgotten artist, so to speak, other than Potter Suits with Peter Hayden. And we had these incredible sculptures that we put in the rooms everywhere. Uh, I think Hayden had one or two exhibitions in South Africa, went overseas and never came back. But the works were really fantastic. And especially the two on the right, the Rain King and Queen, which we were fortunate enough to sell, uh, absolutely outstanding. And I think very interesting dialogue with people like we saw earlier, like Lechai and Kamalo, to Milifeni, that station, very, very elegant all in all. And that brings us uh, from my side at the dot of five, as you always say, Matt, to the end. I think um, if I were to summarize, um, it was an incredible opportunity for us over these years to show almost 400 uh, different artworks in Belgium and over this period of time, or many different artists raising, I think, close to a million rand all in all over that period in time, and really having a, established a cultural center in the heart of, of, of gardens there. Uh, we had an immense amount of fun, uh, and I think it was hopefully a wholesome thing. I would just like at this stage also to thank the whole team that I referred to earlier, uh, without women, including yourself, and as my hanging uh partner and co decision maker on what goes where um you know it's been a very much a team effort and it's been i think immensely rewarding and a privilege and a joy for all of us <laughs>